Good evening and uh, welcome. No need to applaud. Just so happy you're here. Uh, the, uh, welcome to Unexpected Passions at the Wheeler Centre. Uh, forgive me, but you are a bit of an unexpected audience tonight. I didn't think with the weather that uh, anyone would be here. So uh, thank you so much for coming. Give yourself a round of applause, please. <laughs> Very excited about the uh, lineup tonight. Has anyone been to uh, an Unexpected Passion before? Oh, we don't usually get many coming back, so that's... Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So obviously you know how it works. If this is your first time, the idea is to get uh, two talented, witty, engaging people and getting them to talk about um, something that we may not have known but that they are quite passionate about. And uh, I'm very, very excited to... Uh, to that baby uh, to be here. So... Um, <laughs> I can't wait to uh, have them both up here, but we will start with guest number one. Uh, Guido Hatsis, Tom Tomlinson and DJ Dom are just some of the characters that he is responsible for. And uh, Triple M, Nova, 774 are just some of the stations that this very, very talented man couldn't hold a job at. <laughs> and he is now on 3AW. Uh, he is just, he's a comedian, he's a writer, he's a broadcaster. I'm a big fan and it's a big thrill to welcome him to the stage. Um, to me, it makes perfect sense to talk to Tony Moclair about his unexpected passion, aviation. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Moclair. <laughs> Tone, welcome. Thanks, Hi, for, Sam. thanks for dressing up. Thank you. And. Uh, <laughs> No, I love Simpson as a brand. It's good. It's, a, it's, it's coming Coburg back. Coburg Op Shop. Coburg Six dollars, yeah. Six dollars? So, yeah, I lashed out for it tonight. Seems, seems steep. Because I thought you were worth it. <laughs> uh, Tone, first of all, what a list of credits. As well, I didn't mention that you're right on Newstopia, Mad as Hell. Yeah. Um, uh, gambling fans would have known him from... Um, from the poker show uh, yes. during, during yes. 2005. So please don't, whatever you do, don't YouTube that because I've never played poker in my life and I've made some of the most basic errors. Joker uh, poker is the, it was was, the name yeah. of the show. I'm so sorry about that. And, yeah. um, well, I first thought you were great. Oh, thanks. Uh, aviation tone? Yes. Why? Um, <clears throat> well, it started when I was a kid at Mildura West Primary School and I was really big into trucks, like a lot of uh, young boys are. And um, <clears throat> in the library where I'd go, there was a, in the transport section, where you had the books about trucks, next along the line were books about planes. And I'd read all the books about trucks. So they effectively served as like the gateway drug. Right. <laughs> they were like the marijuana that led to the heroin, the sweet, addictive pain cushioning effect of heroin right and so that, that's kind of how i then got into planes so, and me so and friends were your dealer they, well they were they were kind of the introduction they were the soft stuff but yeah. you know i built up a resistance to trucks and i wanted something much harder i just wanted that harder hit and you found it yeah with air, air airplanes or airplanes and, and world war ii they kind of happened at the same time how close we should mention how close were you to picking world war ii as you as your unexpected passion, or was it clearly going to be aviation? I, I think it was clearly going to be aviation, but I, I um, uh, World War II is just, it's too big, too much happened in that six years, but it's, I'm reading Anthony Beaver's history of it at the moment and tut-tutting over a few things too. Really? Yeah, I'm a bit of a snob that way. Talk to me about um, the impact that your passion slash obsession has had on, say, your personal life. Um, well, it's like therapy now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to get you to cry by the end of the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it is kind of all-encompassing. Now, now being um, married and with two children, it's very hard to explain to them that they are the second most important thing in daddy's <laughs> life. <laughs> And that's a very hard thing to explain <laughs> to a four-year-old without resorting to pictures, crudely drawn. And was your was your wife aware of this? You know, when you were courting? 
courting, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's we 1945. It, so, exactly. Yeah. Yes, uh, which is when I met her, when that, <laughs> when that phrase was still in use, Sam. <laughs> no, she... Uh, look, as it turns out, she... We dated like two or three times before we got married. There were breaks in between. So... Um, oh, did you hear? Yeah, a few breaks, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This and is uh, therapy. Right. Okay. So I'll tell you about the meeting with, with my future father-in-law. The first time I met him, we were talking about aeroplanes. And um, he mentioned something about the 767, the Boeing jet. And I corrected it, him on what he said, <laughs> which was very brave of me. <clears throat> he flew them for a living. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And... Uh, <laughs> He was actually right, <laughs> too. What was, the, so, what was the bit that you picked up that you thought was I, I think it was about ceiling. The ceiling, it was, it was about, you know, he said... I said it was about 45,000 feet. And he said, no, it's not. It's 40. And then was able to go into the, you know, operating weight, depending on the engine, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> he just buried me. So, um, uh, so, yeah, and he's... So, Kate's... Kate's dad was a pilot. Kate's mum was a... She's still alive. She was a flight attendant for ANSET as well. Wow. So, you yeah. know, you were, it was just written that you were going to be together. Well, you see, it, I guess it could appear uh, that way, but we, you know, we're obviously very fond of each other and, and it's, not, it's not because of that lineage... You know, although <laughs> people do find it a bit odd that, that Norbert, that's my, my father-in-law, that his ANSI uniform does hang in the bedroom. <laughs> wow, I was about and, to... And I, you know, I'm ready at a moment's notice to put it on, <laughs> should the call come. If, if you, which you know, it never has, all you, right? How, which it never has. How long have you been married? Ten years. Well, you know. Yeah, and we happens. first dated in 91, 92... And so we went on... The second time we dated in the mid-90s, um, we went to the air show. <laughs> and was, we had an argument, yeah. and she took the camera. And at this stage, you know, one of those things when you're married, there's always those little things that a relationship finds it hard to b- progress beyond. And there are pictures of the SU-27 and the T-160, which I'm making up. The Aleutian 76 was there, the firefighting version. I still don't have the photos that I wanted of it because she stormed off with the camera. So you had a fight and she said, I'm taking the camera. She walked off with the camera. And you didn't follow? No. Right. Are you serious? There was (laughs) a (laughs) Kiwi A4 there. Yeah. There was... (laughs) A recently restored CAC boomerang. Yeah. Um, the, 95 was the greatest Avalon of all time. There is... There, Tell me you bought a T-shirt, Tone. Did you be no, at the... No, I didn't. Did you really? No, I just... I got bugger all... Actually, no, I went there on a Triple R media pass. I was at Triple R at the time. And, and got in. Oh, that Triple R media pass. Yeah, that can get you into some have. places. Um, yeah. uh, let's talk about Avalon. Do you, uh, are you religious? Do you not miss them? Or? Well, no, I, I've been to every one. And, uh, <laughs> right, okay. And, and, and it does become a bit of an issue in the, in the, uh, in the planning of the year because I, the, the, uh, the air show itself that, that you, the public, see goes from Friday to Sunday. The air show that the truly obsessed see goes from the arrivals day which is the week before. So say it starts on the Friday, the arrivals, generally the military staff starts on the Sunday before the Friday. So you've got to be there for that. And there's about 200 of us who go out for what's called the roadside air show. It's usually beautiful weather. The sun is in exactly the right position for photos. They come in nice and low. And so there's furious activity there. Then uh, you go to... Then there might be last-minute arrivals on the Monday, so you've got to go out for that. Then of the course, trade yeah. days start. Yeah. Now, you've got to go on the first trade day, which is the Tuesday. You've got to go with lots of bags because they hand out lots of brochures and stuff. And you want to be there before, let's say, the Israeli aircraft industry tent runs out of kefir pins, for example. <laughs> With which you can taunt other aviation fans for 10 years, saying, I got it and you didn't, that sort of thing. So um, you go and load up with your bags, then you go back to the car park, dump the stuff, then go back into the tent and, you know, just basically get as much merch as possible. Um, Then, so that's that day. (laughs) Sorry, the... Can you feel a little bit of fear just coming out from here? Just yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. These, um, 
He has, he's not making this up. No, he no, really no. loves it. No, no. I got about so 20... it sounds like your, your Avalon experience goes, it's like a film festival. It goes for three yeah. weeks. Well, it, this is the thing. Pain, <laughs> painstaking negotiations must begin at least nine months out with, with Kate about the exact number of days. Because if I could, I'd just do the whole thing. I'd be out there for nine days. How many, and what do you end up compromising with? What's through, the number? Through a complex series of negotiations, <laughs> concessions, um, deferred favours. Um, I, I can, at most, squeeze out probably four and a half days. Well, that's... People seem disappointed with that number turn up to hear <laughs> four and a half. But is that the is it, what's the most? It went, like, did have you ever done all nine? No, I haven't. Never, right. never done all nine. Well, it's no. good to have goals though yeah. left in your life. <laughs> Thanks, so. Yeah. Um, well, look, if you were kind enough to cover for me and ring Kate and say I really need Tony today to do some filming around at my house, yeah, you bring the ANSET uniform and I'll <laughs> yeah. put it on. Um, yeah, great. What about uh, Kate? Was aware of this before you met the. The, the family tree just must have knocked your socks off. Yeah. What about, say, you, you know, after the marriage, the honeymoon and the, and the rest of your life? No, well, is it all fine? Um, well, the, the honeymoon was in New Zealand, and I'm not sure if you've had this magical moment on a honeymoon where you look into your partner's eyes, and it, in the reflection of her eyes, you see a Singaporean C-130 doing <laughs> low-level training... <laughs> over the South Island of New Zealand. I couldn't believe it either. It was unbelievable. And I'm not joking. So we... So we... I looked... There were, you just never see a Singaporean Hercules anywhere. We all know that time. Um, it's all right. And, the, and, and there it was in New Zealand. So I tracked it down. And it turns out we followed it to the regional airport where they were, and so we got to see a, a Kiwi, a Kiwi Hercules, a Singaporean Hercules, and with a bunch of paratroopers, and they're doing exercise. So we got a bunch of shots there, and then they were having a an air show that weekend. So I managed to convince my new bride to go to an air show, which took us <laughs> on well, your honeymoon. On my on honeymoon, honeymoon, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and the reason it was New Zealand, it was because only about a year or so or 18 months before that, I'd done a trip of the North Island to every aviation museum in the North Island by myself. It was great. It was a really rewarding by, trip. By your, I can't believe it was by yourself, Tony, to be honest. <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly few takers, you're right. Um, I did have a German hitchhiker on the way back to Auckland who who didn't want to talk about aeroplanes. So it was a very, it was a very boring three-hour chat on the way back. Do you, find, do you back. find yourself just trying to, to... trying to just move conversations to the air? Or are you... Because you, I mean, you're, you're a smart, intelligent, funny oh, man. Thank you, you Sam. You're, yeah. With a level of awareness. So yeah. you know you've got a problem. <laughs> I do... Look, <laughs> I... Um, the, if, if the better angel of my nature has failed... I will nudge the conversation towards it, sometimes with grace, sometimes not. <laughs> but I, uh, I grew up in a very large family, um, and many of us are obsessed with things in my family. Um, and so there was very little kind of consideration given to, to me when I talked about aeroplanes. It was always considered quite boring within the family, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. No, none, no other family members? Uh, Nobody in my family no. cares about planes. Not one. No. Um, and how... this is, you know, I'd, I've got, say, one brother who's obsessed with sport and would, do, would sit on the toilet for three hours uh, commentating cricket matches in which he saved Australia. That sort of thing. Yeah, he's our guest next month, actually, <laughs> yeah, well, so should, I should, can't wait to talk, talk to him. You should talk to him. Yeah, and, you know, other brothers... Are, you know, my mother is obsessed with gardening. We lived in Mildura, like I said. She tried to grow a Japanese gar uh, garden in the driest part of Australia. Like the, one in, like the one Mr Miyagi has in Karate Kid? It's very similar, yes. That's a beautiful garden. Yeah. Try growing it on the edge of a desert. <laughs> right. Didn't work. No, well, she tried. But um, it's that kind of dogged obsession. What about... Um, Aviation, it, I, I should, can you dispel any myths in terms of, like, the little bit that I know is, like, the Wright brothers. Yeah. 
so are they, you know, are they held up on a pedestal or was it, well, you're going to tell me something that someone else invented it before them? Well, there, there is... Why are they special? Well, because they're, they're regarded as the first powered flight, that, that they put a, um, you know, sorry, like a reciprocating engine on an aerofoil and they flew, this flew the aircraft under its own power for uh, however long it took at Kitty Hawk in 1903. There is evidence to suggest, however, that that may have occurred in other parts of the world. It's just the Americans being the Americans and that being the start of the American century. It kind of fitted the whole kind of myth that the Americans, of course, invented powered flight. But there, it depends who you speak to. What do you believe, Tone? What do I, I? The early part of aviation, I don't really care about, to be honest. My, my interest in it kind of takes off from about 1930 onwards, when it got metal, not, not fabric, the, when fabric wasn't covering wings, when stressed metal was. That was That's the strange. Big, but, no, no, yeah. that, 1930 was a big moment because of the change to metal, wasn't yeah, it? They, yeah, it was around then. And you had you know, lots of amazing trans-Pacific flights taking place and uh, the whole barnstorming years and commercial aviation taking off and then the build-up towards World War II. And, yeah, it was, uh, it was incredible. Often with uh, these passions, there's, it often comes up that the, there's a, like a nostalgic lament of, of the pa- uh, involved within the passion. Yeah. Is there, uh, are, there, are there aircrafts that you look back on and, and oh, just... Oh, God, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could. I have yeah. a folder. Are there, are there pictures in your wallet, Tone? What are we talking? No, I, have, <laughs> no, um, I, I, I have a folder on my computer. Maybe, maybe it's because I'm Irish and we're, we're um, generally, uh, I guess the stereotype is sentimental. But uh, a folder on my computer that says extinct, and it's of all the aircraft in the world that no longer exist. There's not a, there's not a bolt left of them. There's, there's nothing. And some of these are incredible aeroplanes. And at the end of World War II, Australia had the fourth largest air force in the world. We'd built one of the best piston engine fighter aircraft of the war. This is an economy that could barely make a sewing machine five years earlier. We had, there was an, air, an aviation engineer who had come to Australia from Europe. He was Jewish. We had no aviation manufacturing capability to speak. Generally, it wasn't, it wasn't that great at the start of the war. We, by the end of the war, we were churning out, you know, state-of-the-art aircraft in Melbourne and Sydney. It was an amazing effort. And this, this engineer, because he was a... Because he was Jewish from Europe, he wasn't a naturalised citizen, he was designing aircraft in mid-morning, but he would only start after reporting to a police station and signing in as an alien, as a, like an enemy alien. Wow. And so we had built this plane, the CA-15, incredible piece of work. Um, it zipped over on its, one of its flights over the bay, stormed over Port Melbourne, low level doing about four, over 400 miles an hour, like something like 430, 440 miles an hour. An incredible achievement. An Australian-made plane. British engineers came out and had to look at the finish on it. They were astonished at the riveting, the quality of the work on it. And um, only one of them flew. Uh, There was about three or four made. In 1947, they were stored out at Laverton. 1947, a new officer came in commanding the base, didn't like them, had them bulldozed, had them chopped up. There's There's not a piece of them left. And, and was, it is heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I don't even know them that well, but I'm affected. Oh, so I, 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 and, the, and I'm sure that in your folder, yeah. the, your extinct folder, there are stories like that there for are, everyone. Yeah, there's, you know, there's just... Uh, uh, maybe not, a, maybe you don't have to tell another one, it's fine. The, well, um, <laughs> the, uh, one of our VCs, we went to a jackaroo named Middleton, one of VC. He was flying a plane called the Short Sterling, a terrible plane in some ways, a great plane in others. Did two runs over the target. He had two blokes in his crew that night who were on 29 missions. You were, at, you were off at 30, and you had a 25% chance of surviving your tour in Bomber Command. So they did two runs over the target, got hit by flak. He was blinded in one side of his eye, flew the plane, you were in Italy recently, so you know what I'm talking about, flew from Turin back to England, ordered the crew to bail out. Two stayed with him out of loyalty. They died, and he won the Victoria Cross. Um, this and there's no sterlings left. That's the point that I wanted to make. There's no, this is not, and this is not a silly question, but how... how do you know that in terms of how are resources and 
books and films and uh, are there, is documentaries are there plenty is there plenty there for you Tom? There, well, yeah there's well there's quite there's quite a bit um you can go into aviation bookstores, but I took my wife into one once and she said... Wow. It, wow. It, she, it, yeah. No wonder you had some breaks, Tone, I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> <laughs> You're really, yeah. You're really she, pushing it. She, actually, no, I, t- I, I took her in a model aircraft store and she said it was like going into an adult bookshop <laughs> because it was full of men who wouldn't look you in the eye if you were a female. <laughs> So, um, so we are we are well resourced in that. There's an excellent one called Highlands here, which has everything you need. I thought I'd give them a plug. It's a um, great store. We, depending on what time it's open, we can all yeah. head there after yeah, let's uh, start. Uh, when yeah. we're done. Um, what about um, what, you loved this? This is you said from an early age. Yeah. Did you have ambitions to? To make it a you know your, uh, yes. a job. Well, I I did, and they were in any uh, capacity, not necessarily pilot, or or is, was that that's obviously the glamour one. Yeah, uh, male flight attendant. Do you think I, I'd never? <laughs> you, I think <laughs> you'd be great, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. In what? It, just in what way? I, I think you'd be. Um, because you know sometimes you're caught next to a passenger. Yeah. Who you don't want to talk to. Right. Well, you could. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like, well, I'll tell no, you actually, I'll... now I'm re- there's a passenger and there's a flight attendant who I don't both want to talk to, so yeah. it would be a terrible flight. But anyway, <laughs> right. why, never, why didn't you become a pilot? Well, um, I had... Uh, my, my ambition too was stoked by my dad, and he said, well, here's what you'll do. You'll get onto the Hercules flying for the Air Force, and then you get onto uh, four-engine aircraft in Qantas, and, you, and that'd be the plan. Unfortunately, my ability at maths and my eyesight conspired greatly and and I knew uh, right until so we'd gone to we'd moved back to Ireland in the mid 80s after dad died we lived there for two years came back so I started HSC only having done about three or four months of year 11 and at the school I was at they said okay what subjects do you want to do so I said well I I still kind of had the plan then to do to be a pilot so I, I chose maths now I've never been stellar at maths but I knew the jig was up when I, st- <laughs> I studied a test, a maths test, the first one that I'd had in year 12, <laughs> and I got 2%. <laughs> which, wow, which to this day, I still assume is a point for getting both my first name and my surname, <laughs> not only in the right order, but spelled correctly. <laughs> 2%? 2%. Um, can I ask what, um, what area of mathematics was? I was, was trigonometry or something like that, and we... We were talking just before about when you're completely stumped by a mass question on a, on a mass exam, you've just got to pretend that you're making an attempt at working out the problem. So yeah, well, I, I was, are we the only ones who, anyone that did mass, and uh, you'd, I remember in exams you'd get to a question that you realise you'd have no possible chance of getting the right answer to, but... If you do a little bit of working out, yeah. sometimes there's a possibility. I'm seeing lots of nods of the head, so that's great. Yeah, great. And you, just, you would just start writing ran- numbers randomly, yeah. hoping that they'd say, well, he had a go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably not going to be enough to be a pilot's tone, no, I'm guessing. No, not really. Not if I'm calculating the fuel load of an aircraft yeah. <laughs> with, with a bunch of orphans on board as we We're go not, through the mountains at night. We, need, could be... we need more than 2% for yeah. you to, to be in charge of a plane. So, so and... Uh, how did you handle that? The news, I suppose, it wasn't really given to you. You kind of realised, or were what? you actually two percent? Were you so stupid you didn't even realise? <laughs> <laughs> no. no, well, the, the teacher said, he said you've got a between a zero and none chance of making it. I thought they're good odds. <laughs> From what I know, I'm there. But um, no, so it didn't quite work out. I, I, should, was, I should mean, I was so excited. I haven't, I been, haven't actually done this night for a, a last month. The Rise Festival's on. And, and uh, so it's been a while since I've been there. I was so excited to, to do it that I actually forgot to mention that the other guest, Jess Maguire, will be, <laughs> is coming up soon. And also, at the end, if there's any questions about, to Tone or to Jess about their passion, we are, we'll leave some time. So... Um, uh, we'll leave lots of time for Tone, by the way, if you ask him one. Um, I, I want to... My... Uh, in terms of popular culture, television and film, mm. you know, uh, Flying High. Yeah. Um, Dean yep. Martin in 
airplane or yeah. airport, sorry. Airports. And um and Top Gun. Top yeah. Gun was quite a seminal film for me growing up. Yeah. Now I kind of the way aviation has been depicted in in popular culture mm. are you are you happy on the whole well i could uh, this is the thing that I, I think and this might be a theme maybe jess might expand on this the more obsessed you are with something the less of a sense of humor you have about it generally speaking so i could cop in flying high 707 with the sound effect of propeller engines i thought that was a <laughs> You know, that joke yeah. was okay, but, you know, I would have preferred to have heard the sound of four Pratt & Whitney JT-8Ds doing their thing. And if you look at a 707, you'll notice that not all four engines have the auxiliary intake above the JT-8. The number one engine doesn't. So that's something to, um, to look out for. Um, <laughs> wow. But I was, I was going to ask about the co-pilot, if that's what they, if they really just blow up. So um, <laughs> no. I'm glad you got in there. Um, but it, it, does, it does make watching movies very hard. For example, um, the wife was... She'd gone to Venus Bay the other day, taken the two kids. I had the house to myself, so I did what any man alone with a DVD player would do. I got a box set of Foils War out. <laughs> Right. And I, I, I'm unaware of that. Oh, it's a great show. It's a yeah. period show set in World War II in Britain. Right. Yeah, with the gorgeous honeysuckle wigs. Yeah. Is, did yeah. you put the ANSET uniform on and watch it? Uh, or did you just... <laughs> yeah. yeah, did you have the house to yourself, though? Yeah, I'd have don't. to, yeah. All right. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was, I was, no, I was muffed to That was fine. Yeah, yeah. No uniform. So the, the episode started with a, a Spitfire um, kind of hoving into view and then, you know, coming short finals and then landing. And immediately it began. Okay, I know it's either a Mark V or a Mark VIII with the 20 millimeter Ehrlichan cannon, the four blade propeller. So if this show is set any time before 1941, it's going to almost ruin it for me. Because, you, and I watched The Battle of Britain. This is a movie I watched with my dad. Um, and if you watch that, I, I watch it now and I, I almost can't enjoy it because the engines are wrong on the German planes and there's four-bladed Spitfires. There were never four-bladed Spitfires during the Battle of Britain. There were too many exhaust stubs in some of them. There were only three on the Mark Ones that they were using. That sort of thing. And so it goes on and on. And I was, I, when I saw Top Gun in the cinemas in 1986, they, they attempted to pass off a Northrop F5 as a MiG-28. And at that point, I stormed out. And um, I, I just said to the girl in the ticket counter, I didn't pay $15 to be treated like an idiot. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> I'm, you know, right. that's just insane. No. Number but, one, hey, in 1986, there was yeah. no such thing as a MiG-28. Right. Because they all have odd numbers, as anyone would know. <clears throat> the Mickey Yang Gurevich Design Bureau, they're not a company, they're yeah. a design bureau. They get a factory to make the aircraft, they simply design them. Staying with Top Gun. Yeah. <laughs> when, um, when Goose and Maverick are yeah. sent up to Top Gun by Stinger, and yeah. he says, okay, uh, it's like or they'll a be flying I... plastic dog shit out of Hong Kong. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, can't, I can't believe what I've got to do. I've got to send you two punks up to Top Gun. <laughs> yeah. But getting sent up to Top Gun, is that a, that's a pretty big thing. What, what, yeah. is, what is actually Top Gun? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's the US Navy uh, Fighter Weapons Training School. They were, what they realised when they went into Vietnam, the US Navy went in, in flying A4s and F4s and that sort of thing, they only had a three-to-one kill ratio over the poorly, well, poorly trained uh, North Vietnamese Air Force flying comparatively less sophisticated aircraft without radar. For the US Navy, three to one in a, uh, let's say, the equivalent of a $50 million plane shooting down a $10 million plane it was very bad economics. They needed a much higher kill ratio. So what the purpose of Top Gun was, was to simulate the first 10 to 15 missions a pilot would undertake in a combat zone. And that was to subject him, because there were no female pilots in the 60s, there are now, there's a lot, um, was sub to subject those pilots and the backseater who operated the radar to as much stress as possible in order to immerse them in a simulated combat environment 
and improve their kill ratio and improve their chances of surviving. Because by the mid 60s, to train a pilot to fly, you know, a high end jet was a very expensive business, and it still is. So it was to basically do that. So you, they were sent there because... The, and, and what happens is Goose and Maverick would have come back to the squadron with great tales to tell, hilarious stories about chatting up women at the bar, singing Righteous Brothers songs and that sort of thing. Yeah. But they, not only that, but they would have imparted all the knowledge that they'd earned at, at Top Gun to everyone else in the squadron. But Goose died, Tom. So he didn't did, get to yeah. do it. He did. He didn't know the God. He, even I knew this watching the film as a 16-year-old in 1986. Only an idiot gets into a flat spin in an F-14. You don't get out of that. No, you don't. You just don't. don't. (laughs) So Um, he was was gone for all money as soon as he entered Coffin Corner. I'm pretty sure that there'll be more Top Gun questions, uh, perhaps from the audience. I've got one more to finish with uh, late, but... um, Tone, I, I just thank you so much for coming. Not that you're going, but just yeah. uh, the time has flown and we actually better get Jess up here. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Tony Moclair. Thank you. Thank you. Why do I have a feeling, Tone, that there's so much more? Uh, there is, isn't there? Aviation is interesting, isn't it, Sam? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in. I'm all in. Great. Much like you when you played... Joker poker, you're, I'm all in. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, let's um, let's change the tack. Was this what the, the beauty of unexpected passions is? Is that um, different topics and different uh, people? So um, my second guest, I am a big fan of as well. I first met her at Triple R radio station when she came and did a television segment on uh, on the show I was on and. Uh, I'll never forget when she came in and, and reviewed um, and recommended uh, a show called The Wire, which uh, five seasons, um, and it had been finished for two years. So that's, uh, that's where I met her. And um, I've watched it, Jess. Unlike you, I think, about listening to a review. Um, she is a writer and a broadcaster. That, what else? Are you? Anything else? Uh, she appears regularly on 774. <laughs> Let's. Uh, it makes perfect sense to me to get Jess McGuire to talk about British reality pop band Girls Aloud. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jess McGuire. Oh, yeah, sorry. She can be heard every Monday to Friday on the Breakfasters. Sorry. You don't have to mention my actual job. Just past <laughs> reviews would be great. Um, how's, how's Breakfasters going? How long have you been doing it, Jess? Uh, since, I think, uh, end of 2010. Because you're sitting next to Triple R Royalty over there, oh, Tony yeah. Moclair. I'm sandwiched yeah. by Triple R Royalty, well. Sam. Yeah. 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 <laughs> who's who's think... higher up the royal chain, do you think? Oh, who don't make me choose. Who would be the Earl here? I would have or... said Sam earlier, but having listened to your love of aviation, I kind of want to hang out with you a little bit more, oh, Tony. Oh, so, so, yeah. 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 It's, uh, can I tell you... I, <laughs> An aviation obsession is such a chick magnet. It's, uh, it, uh, bitches no, love planes. Yeah, it's true. it really gets yep. him in, Sam. Yes, Jess has said, bitches love planes. So, <laughs> yeah. well done. Uh, Jess, let's... Uh, a British reality pop band, Girls Aloud. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, I, I, I guess I've always had a big love and appreciation of pop music. As a whole, there was probably a teenage period where I just wanted to listen to loud grunge music and have lots of feelings. But when I came out of that, I and I also um, sort of amateur little songwriter in my bedroom as a kid. That's me playing the guitar right there. Right. So you can see why I've not gone anywhere with my music career. Um, but as someone that sort of was really interested in songwriting and kind of understanding the craft of songwriting, it, I, I was aware enough of the fact that while I still love a lot of indie musicians and a lot of beautiful songwriters, that there is a huge skill and a talent of writing a really great pop song. And I guess I always feel kind of a bit defensive of an underdog as well. And I think that in Australia, pop music is a real underdog. So combining, I guess, an interest in, in, in interesting songwriting. I mean, a lot of pop music in the charts is rubbish. But when you find something good those moments where you hear a crazy in love by Beyonce or something, that's why, that's why you love it. All right, so what makes Girls Aloud uh, different from, say, Bardot? 
Well, it's a good question because they both came from the same show. So, Girls Aloud, I happened to be in the UK when Girls Aloud were formed and they were part of a reality show called Pop Stars The Rival. So, the first series of Pop Stars had launched a guy named Will Young, I think. He might still have a career in the UK, but he, he wasn't a huge phenomenon, I don't think. Not in the industry, but he's Not working in the industry, still, but sure he's, he's working at RSLs or <laughs> yeah, something exactly. over in the UK. Um, and the success of that show, and it was a phenomenon, that first series of pop stars inspired there to be a pop stars in Australia and pop stars in different countries. The second series of pop stars, to make it a bit different, they decided to have band versus a band, and the idea was to have a process to create a girl band and a p- process to create a boy band. Hence the name... Rivals. Mm -hmm. So the girl band was created and the boy band was created and they were managed by separate judges and it was all meant to be a competition for the Christmas number one. Now, I was in the UK while this show was on and I could not have cared less and I didn't watch it, but it was hard to be not swept up in the hype for the Christmas number one because if anyone's ever been to the UK in Christmas, you would know that the Christmas number one is a pretty big deal over there. And Girls Loud won it. Now, the interesting thing that I look back on now is that Girls Loud won it with a song that was very different to most songs that are released by reality show winners because, you know, it's always like, my journey's finally over. <laughs> you know, it's always something along those lines. You just yeah. think, ah. Oh. Um, whereas these, these, the song that they, they released was this kind of fast, upbeat pop song. It was, so that's already unusual in itself. And it was written by a guy named Brian Higgins who has a production company called Xenomania. And what kind of made Girls Loud different is that after that number one single, I guess... The guy, the guy from the reality show that was meant to be managing them swiftly lost interest because everyone expects these things to, you know, they release the single, you sell out. lots, yeah. and then they fizzle out. But by that stage, you've got the, second seri- the next series on and it doesn't really matter. But the girls kind of kept managing themselves and, and just like a cockroach, they just wouldn't go away and they just kept doing a new song, a new song. But what makes them different, different to a lot of other pop stars is that if you know anything about pop music, you know that there's a lot of different songwriters that people work with and there's a reason why a lot of their material will sound different or an album will sound like a lot of different songs cobbled together. It doesn't have a cohesive sound as an album as, say, a band that writes their own music that works with a producer, records a whole album together. You can kind of listen to the whole thing and go, ah, that all makes sense. Whereas really it's, okay, we'll stick the three or four singles that sold well on there and a couple of B-sides and, you know, wrap it up and someone will buy it. They worked with the same songwriters, Xenomania, and that's a really unusual thing in pop music. So they actually, over a a number of albums, and no one expected them to stick around, but they kind of just kept sticking around. They began producing really good records, and not really good records in the sense of they sold lots, which they still did, but really good records in the sense that Unexpected people were batting for them. You had NME, the you know the music press in the UK. They were the one pop band it was okay to love and to kind of really respected music writers in the Guardian, the Observer were going. These guys are actually amazing, and it kind of floored I think everyone because they were just doing. They never ever sound like anyone else. They don't sound like. There's been a trend in pop music of having chick singer. R&B sort of beat, some rapper that you hire comes in, does something over the top and it all sounds very urban and they don't sound like anything else that you're hearing anywhere else but they sound like them and I think that's a pretty amazing skill to have and I think that was about a 10 minute answer no, but to amazing, the question yeah, why. But it, amazingly, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in the room, I think you've won me over. Like that was, uh, that was... That you they wait s- till I tell you about their television shows. Just, just hold on, Jess. Just hold on. The, um, I want to, for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about the actual makeup of Girls Aloud? Oh, of course I can. I can rate them in order of preference too. No, Girls Aloud are made up of uh, five very different girls with different hair colours. No, they kind of are like that. You know, with all pop bands, that you, you get to pick a favourite. But uh, uh, there's Cheryl Cole, there's Sarah Harding, there's Kimberly Walsh, there's Nicola. Oh. First names would have been fine. Nicola, just, just their first no, name I'm angry at myself. There's Nicola and there's someone, I don't care. Oh, Nadine, the Irish one, who has a very thick accent to the point where Irish people, and I've seen them in TV shows, go, I don't understand what she's saying. <laughs> like, that's my Scottish pirate that I do for anyone from Europe. But, uh, but yeah, the, even the Irish think that accent's a bit much. Which, which you know, She's obviously spent time in Fiji as well. Um, uh, and, and, and what are they, they like? Are they... This the 2002 is that when you were you, yeah yeah, yeah Christmas they, 2002. So in terms of longevity and success, they've you've said that they kind of have separated themselves from other bands that have yeah. formed this way. Yeah. Um, how what are, do the girls get along? Have they had solo career? What, what's the what's the current state of play? 
Well, I guess for a long time they were trying to make money because I, if you're seeing people in the charts all the time and on the TV all the time, you would have an idea, you would have a, a suspicion that they're making a lot of money. But anyone that actually know works any part of the music industry, even if you're in Melbourne and you work in the music industry, you know that it, everything depends on royalties and publishing rights and how much you've signed away to a record company. So they're not writing their own music, but they are working, I guess, creatively with a production house that is using them as a muse and using them a, a, as a tool. And they, they are working together there. So I guess in a way they're contributing to the creative process, but <clears throat> they don't get any of the royalties and a lot of stuff, they're with record labels that would have been taking a fair bit of money. So you, 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 your face is everywhere. You've lost the privacy part of life, but you're not getting any cash. So you start doing things for money. They kind of started doing a lot of television shows that are oddly endearing, and I think it's really reflective of British television, that they just crap out any TV show about anything. So my favourite <laughs> Girls Lad television show, and Friends shudder when I try and make them watch it, because no one else enjoys it as much as me who finds it hilarious. But there's a British show, a TV show called Ghost Hunting with dot, dot, dot. And this concept is just flat out brilliant. They will just pick, select each episode. Might be the cast of Coronation Street. Might be British girl band Girls Aloud. They take Britain's favourite girl band and place them in several haunted houses around Britain with night vision cameras. Hilarity ensues Genius. and you watch the results as the women slowly shit themselves as the <laughs> ghosts are throwing rocks. Cheryl Cole gets into a fight with a ghost. Gets into a fight with a ghost. I, I find it adorable. I try and show people this and they go, you are crazy, Jess, and why are you making me watch this? How long is, the, how long is an episode? It's too long. I've tried yeah. to rewatch it. But, like, right. but the thing, the thing who, that sorry, made... who won the fight? <laughs> I think that the ghost won. Yeah, I think they right. were forced to leave as a ghost under an asylum kept throwing pebbles at their head. So that'll happen. If you hang out there. Um. Um, yeah, but look, they did a lot of different TV shows, which are, which are pretty funny. But the, I think the reason that I love them as well, and it's worth keeping in mind how I fell into it. Because, I, I mean, I, I, I love pop music, and I'm not obsessed with all pop bands. Well, I was going to ask, because you, uh, you are currently a breakfaster yeah. on Triple R, traditionally uh, an alternative mm. um, independent radio station when it comes to music especially, which is why it's loved. Mm. How, how does that sit with your love of pop music and in this case girls allowed a reality based mm. pop band i mean i love all music and i think that anyone that's open-minded is open to hearing a good song and i think that as long as girls allowed it we're putting out good pop singles i mean i, I mean I, i'm not ashamed of my interests at all but i think it's pretty funny that triple r because they've tried several times by the way to launch girls allowed in australia to dismal dismal results so how, no one is interested in girls allowed how have they done that jess they came out and did a publicity tour in, I think, 2006. Cheryl got drunk on, in the hotel minibar and vomited outside the hotel. They got peed on by some koalas. No one was at all interested in the process. <laughs> it was filmed for a television show. Of course it was. But, it, but no one cares about them. So you mentioned... Should have, it's a shame they should have uh, played Avalon. And then they at, least, at, least, at least Tony, <laughs> Tony would have seen would have it. Would have that would have been them. good. But, I mean, girl... That, more Triple R listeners would know who Girls Aloud are than, any, than, than Fox FM and their because actual target audience would know because I because banged on about them because I got obsessed with them. And the reason that I got obsessed with them is because I have quite an addictive personality and so when I try and give up something like cigarettes, I have to replace it with a new interest. I know this sounds weird, but so the first time I tried to give up smoking in 2009, I became obsessed with Fleetwood Mac. Of course I did. And then, <laughs> yeah. and that was my sole focus. And so instead of smoking, I had a little iPod on me at all times and I would stick in and listen to Seven Wonders. Not even like cool Fleetwood Mac, uncool 86 Fleetwood <laughs> yeah. Mac, whatever. And so when I gave it up the second time in 2010, I just sort of started listening to Girls Loud because my friend Will had sent me a CD. And he just began, he was like a dealer and he was in the UK and he would just send me more and more things and sort of pique my interest a little bit more into the next thing. I'm, I'm reading autobiographies, boring my friends about it. All I wanted to do was talk about it. But I, I can reconcile it by thinking that a, a good pop music in this country is probably, it's more punk to like that than it probably is to like a lot of alternative music, which gets a hell of a lot of airplay. And a lot of these, you know, indie posing bands are signed to major labels and getting plenty of airplay everywhere. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not too phased about it. And I think, you know, I think it's nice to have a variety of interests. No, <laughs> no, I'm with you. Jesus, I'm... Sam. Yes, no, I brought. Well, you know, I, when I was doing the, uh, that show, I, you know, I brought. It's it's about bringing your obsession and making it somehow accessible, mm. which 
Tone, you're, you're yet to do that with aviation, <laughs> too, I should tell you that, Tone. But, you know, I... I you know, I brought Burt Reynolds in t- with me to e- every show almost and just crowbarred him into mm. everything. It didn't end well, but it's, I had a go. I, uh, I played the cult She Sells Sanctuary once and got abused. Was that too mainstream? Yeah. Yeah, we got get that the other day with off. a Cat Power song. Wow. I just, I just don't get where you would play something. I just don't like the direction she's gone in. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, we didn't get the memo of songs you don't like personally, but we'll be sure to update the station's playlist. We don't have a playlist to look up. Um, but, no. yeah. Well, that's good news. It sounds like that your mission to have Girls Aloud as an album of the week is really Failing alive dismally. and well, mm. alive and well at least. Yeah. Uh, Tone, any, any questions for Jeff? Well, you say 2002. Now, pop music, generally speaking, is maybe um, has the sh- shortest shelf life mm. in terms of how durable it is. I'm a big fan of the Smiths, but I can't listen to them. While it's witty, it doesn't have a lot of weight. Do you know what Mm. I mean? And I don't think after 25 years, I don't think it stands up that well. Controversial, I know. After 10 years, can you listen to an early Girls Aloud track and think, a bit dated? Well, no, because but I think that I mean that's for me, and I don't. uh, There, there, I could put together a great Girls Aloud playlist, and I probably there's one album called Chemistry that you could listen to from beginning to end, and it is just a fantastic record, full stop, and that's the reviews that it got in all in all the major music press as well. But the other songs, I mean, it's a it's it's a pop band, but the one thing that probably gives them more longevity is the fact that they don't sound like anything else at the time so there's a lot of pop music that all sounds the same and it all sounds like oh, it all sounds like 2002 mm. but when you don't sound like anybody else and you just sound like you doing pop music I don't know I guess I guess it makes it a bit more ageless mm. but they kind of were still a bit the underdog for a long time and it was they came into their own in 2009 and they finally released this song that that it went number one but it was huge and it won them a Brit and you, you had people like Chris Martin from Coldplay and Bono and all these people sort of it was kind of cool to like Girls Loud and say that you like them so I don't know, they're, they're a weird thing and, and my focus, I was really obsessed with it during a particular period and I've kind of, I, I've let go of that but as tonight has sadly proven to me, you ask me about Girls Aloud and I'll talk yeah. and it's really upsetting, I just realised I'm not over it at all, I thought like, <laughs> I thought I'd like kicked it because it was full on, I had a best friend that, I still have a best friend and she didn't get rid of me but she was like... She, I like to say she pretended to be interested in Girls Aloud to become my friend, but after about two months of our friendship, she sat me down and she went, you have to stop talking about them. But what I like about it is that, you know, when you're a kid, when you were a little, little kid and you loved music and you had, I don't know if it's New Kids on the Block or something, but there was something really childlike about that enthusiasm that we would get for a pop band and you'd pick a favourite and you'd love the songs and you'd dream of being part of the band. Seems, and that, sounds like that about One Direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. what, that's, no, but that's not a joke. I mean, that's what the teenage girls think like. Yeah. They, they, they obsess over it and you get consumed by it. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's actually kind of a bit joyous to be so wholeheartedly consumed by a band. And then we get to an age and we outgrow it and even though I love music and I love artists I, I, I approach them as an adult that understands music and I well that album's a bit weaker and da, da, da. like you look at it as a logical way as an adult but a little bit of that spark I guess in, in obsessive love for a pop band you can't muster it up again and what was phenomenal for me was somehow this this spark of a, being a pop music lover as a kid that had maybe died down just flared up again and I'd, n- I'd not felt that way t- since I was like 10 and and with all my new kids on the block merchandise and I loved it and one time my housemate came home this is not a joke and I really wish it was and I was sitting on the couch looking quite sad it was about two in the morning just looking quite dejected and she came in and she was like Jess what's what's going on and my answer which was quite honest I said I just realized I'm never going to be a member of Girls Aloud <laughs> But I genuinely had had this wave of sadness. I was like, it's too late for me. I'm 29. I'm never going to learn how to dance or sing like that. They've already formed the band. It's never going to happen. And I was genuinely really upset about it. And then I thought, you've got a problem. Yeah. What I love about... and we, If there are any questions, um, put your hand up and Seb or uh, Ben will come and uh, give you the microphone. But I, what I love about... Um, about the format and about the guests, and especially you two, is that um, the passion at which you speak, and it's also cr- it's insane. It is insane, I can and hear um, yeah, but also the well, the words that have, you've both used include dealer, <laughs> kicked it, her- heroin, yeah, and what was it? yeah, it just it's, it's gateway, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's it's. Uh, 
if you doubt the passion of the topics, um, there's no need. It's. Uh, I feel weird about it. You've, to be you've chosen well. That's yeah. what I'm both. That's what I'm saying to you both. Are, are there any questions for Jess or Tony about well their topics or anything at all? Um, non commercial uh, air pi uh, pilot license. Uh, no, I've been. I have been flying a few times, but it was enough to confirm in me the very deep suspicion that I should never do it, and the maths teacher was right. Um, so I, it's been fun, but um, to actually. You know, devote the time, the energy, and the money to it now is. is I think I, I may have missed my window, but we'll. Uh, Does it I'll upset you when people like Angelina Jolie just fly themselves around everywhere, carefree? Yeah, yeah, it passing does. tests left, right, and centre. Yeah, well, she can do anything though. Yeah, she I can. Mean, she, and the thing is, with her, even if she can't sit the pilot's test for her, she will adopt an eight-year-old Ethiopian boy <laughs> who can do it for her. <laughs> That's, she's just so talented. Well, Tom Cruise can fly, John yeah. Travolta, oh, well, I was going to ask, does, it, does your obsession with flying and enthusiasm for it make you like people a lot more than you probably should? Like, do you begrudgingly go, hey, hey, John Travolta's an all right guy, don't be saying those rumours about him? Well, yes, and, th and this, well... <laughs> this I, is being I, filmed, I, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. Church of Scientology, I have nothing but the ultimate respect yeah, yeah. for your leaders. Well, the camera's actually see, over there, Jess, I think so. That, that's a good, that's a very good question, Jess, because, and this... Uh, living in the inner city, this one always gets me into trouble at dinner parties when I say, OK, well, would the, the public perception, not helped by the man himself, is that George Bush is, is quite dumb. He, however, flew one of the most difficult planes of the era to fly. It was a plane called the F-102. He flew it in Texas. Hot, humid air. This is a delta wing aircraft that comes, what they say, over the fence at about 160 knots. It's very, very diff it's difficult. It's difficult to land and uh, a difficult plane to fly. He trained on it, and his instructor, when he was at flight school, said, and this man had no political allegiance, this is during the 2000 election, he said George Bush was in the top 10% of pilots I ever trained. And, you, I mean, you've got to... You've got to pay that. That's I. I look so at that. So he passed think, the test too. He passed the test. Yeah, and that is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. So it, it, it in some cases it does inform my opinion of people. Yes, in short. So do you like George Bush now? Well, I, I'm not. I'm not like a huge fan, but I, I do. <laughs> I, I, I certainly. You know, I don't think he's evil incarnate, but I. I I'll I, say this about Saddam. He yeah. no, I mean, <laughs> no, 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 but but I, I certainly respect the fact that he that he mastered the F one hundred and two. That's all I'll say. Saddam or George? <laughs> Saddam. So, so George, <laughs> uh, <laughs> whose dad was a pilot as well. George W. George W. Bush's dad flew torpedo bombers during World War Two, and he got shot down. Wow, is there, just, is there anything that George Jr. didn't follow his father into? Is he just a presidency, pilots? Um, question in the middle there. Um, Jess, I'm wondering, did you actually kick the smoking? Um, I, <laughs> sp sporadically, I do, so that's really good. Um, I, I'm not a day-to-day -day smoker anymore, and I'll go like three or four months with nothing, and then I kind of have a frenzy for about two weeks and then I, I took up running as a new obsession. That was this year's one and so I was really good when I was running and I've had a couple of months of being a bit more lax about those things. It's been a stressful couple of months so I kind of turned back to, to the cigarettes. But maybe you're right, I should listen to more Girls Aloud. I'm just hearing what I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> so I should did, be. Did you, you were listening to Fleetwood Mac was it when you gave up smoking. I did. So you went from... <laughs> Smoking to the music of people who set the benchmark in the 70s yeah. for cocaine addiction. Yeah, <laughs> I did. <laughs> to kick my own addiction, I turned to it. The funny thing is, like, I, I was so obsessed with it that I just said to people, well, I will just, I'm going to meet Stevie Nicks. Like, I'm just going to be, of course I am. And people were like, that's batshit crazy. Yeah. And November last year, I met Stevie Nicks. Wow. Yeah, and I got to hang out with her and interview her. Well, I pretended to interview her. I didn't really. <laughs> like, I did. I bought in a dictaphone. But really, I had a girl that I went to school with that worked for Woman's Day that knew I really liked Stevie Nicks. And she arranged for me to fly up and be the first person in the room and hang out with Stevie Nicks for about half an hour. It was meant to be 15 minutes, but Stevie liked me. Had half an hour of chatting to her, trying to play it cool, but putting the dictaphone on the table. My hand was like this. <laughs> hey, Steve, it's great to have you. No, but, uh, but, um, but yeah. Wait, what did you talk about? How was she? Oh, I had to make up some 
just in her interests. I just feigned interest in them. Oh, Glee, that does sound good, Stevie. I'll be sure to watch it. She did tell me to watch Glee. And she also is passionate about the Twilight novels and her last album has a song written that she, uh, she rushed home after going to the theatre in Brisbane and seeing Twilight uh, New Moon or something. I don't know if that's what it's called. But, and wrote a song about it and she's really into Twilight and Glee. Right, right so that, sounds like it the, was, that sounds like the longest half an back. hour of my life, <laughs> by the way. Um, I took up smoking again immediately afterwards. <laughs> yes, on the way out. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, up the bat. Um, just a quick question for Jess. Um, you made the point about uh, Girls Aloud sound nothing like you know, the majority of what was in the charts at the time and since. Um, can you draw sort of a parallel with, say, Adele in that they, she doesn't and her success you know she sold 10 million albums whereas you know which is more than mm. you know your Katy Perry's and other sort of R&B based the originality um, being a, a really appealing factor I guess yeah so why, why do you think that you, you don't see more artists like that I mean the, I guess that then it would sort of defeat their you know uniqueness then, and everyone would sound like that but why do, why, why do you think that the music industry or record industry as such doesn't invest more into you know that classic pop songwriting rather than just that you know, follow the leader kind of sound that sort of tends to populate, you know, the top 40. Well, I guess music isn't making the money that it used to make for probably an assortment of reasons, um, but people aren't buying the number of records that they used to buy like they did. You know, you can have you would have a hit in the 70s and have a room stacked with blocks of cocaine. You would be fine and that's, you know, and, and now people can barely afford anything. You know, you read about the excess of the 70s of the musicians that had mild hits there and people that have hits now that aren't making anything. Um, and there's probably a few different reasons in the approach that people consume music and how they pay for it that might be affecting it. But the end result is that... I guess record companies are a lot more conservative and boring when it comes to the creative process. So with pop music, they're, they're more inclined to want to use the same songwriters and, but, but sort of the same songwriters for all the different artists. They would send them all to the same people. So you've got Red One, who's someone that writes with um, Lady Gaga and stuff like that. Do you, you might remember the period in the late 90s, early 2000s, and you, when you had Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys, and a lot of their singles, you could kind of hum one chorus over the other chorus. Or the Veronicas have a song that is... You and you, uh, Pink has a song, You and Your Hand. Your, that's how you have to pronounce it when it's you and an R put together. And it's exactly the same as pretty much as a Veronica's song. And that's because the same guy, Max Martin, was responsible for all of them. Max Martin was writing hits. He's a guaranteed hit machine. Send them all there. Same with Linda Perry in maybe like ever since... Christina Aguilera had Beautiful and stuff like that. She's written for all those pop singers and it was like Linda Perry, guaranteed hit. They send them to the same people. So instead of getting a songwriter and an artist collaborating to have a sound for the artist, you're getting a sound for a whole genre of music because it's being produced by so few people because no one wants to risk anything because it's there's so much money to lose, there's not enough money coming in. The danger, of course, is that we now know. I mean, if, if, you, you, if you don't take a risk, you don't get those massive payoffs. And if you, it, it, we're really lucky that someone like Adele is, is able to get up there because really weren't the odds kind of stacked against her? She's not, she's not a scrawny former reality show, dancing, singing, choreographed thing. She's, she's, you know, a really normal girl that makes a real effort to be a really normal woman that that writes music and is really passionate about it. And it would be really great if record companies could see that sometimes a bit of truth and honesty and, and can, could resonate with people as well and that, that it pop can be done in a really intelligent and smart way. It's not... Uh, I get pissed off when people that claim to love music are really close-minded about pop because some of the best stuff that we've had in the last 10 years is, is from the pop world and there's a lot of stuff that all sounds the same in the indie music world so give me give me Adele writing rolling in the deep a thousand times over some tedious grunge or you know not grunge grunge doesn't even exist anymore but you know someone <laughs> someone with the with you know twee jangly guitars singing nonsense <laughs> like Adele every time all I got out of that is Adele should do a grunge album. That's yeah. what I got out of that. Um, anyone else? Just one more. Uh, we do finish on time here at the Wheeler Centre. I'm always reminded. No, that's fine. Th I just wanted to thank you two for uh, a, a magnificent hour. I, I do love, uh, you know, understandably, the passion in which you spoke about your unexpected passion. But the... Um, the fact that both of you got to a point with your passion where you had to be told, 
that it wasn't going to happen. Mm. Tone, you, you came to the conclusion eventually that yeah. after... Two percent. You in mass. You weren't going to be a pilot. Yeah. Worst. A friend came in and told you amazingly that you weren't going to be a. No, I ma- told me. She just you- saw me crying after I realised <laughs> that what I had said was true. I think you would have got to the answer eventually <laughs> yourself, Jess, that you weren't going to be a member of Girls Aloud, and uh, you've just captured the spirit of the night uh, beautifully. So, thank you all for coming. But please thank Jess McGuire and Tony Moclair. Thank you.